Okay, it's going to be a review of King of the Ring 1999. We're in the month of June. I still think historically uh, King of the Ring is the most prestigious pay-per-view in the history of WWE from June pay-per-views. At one point, King of the Ring used to be one of the big five uh, pay-per-views for the WWE, but those days are uh, long gone. It doesn't look like WWE is going to be bringing back King of the Ring uh, on a pay-per-view anytime soon. You know, they might bring it back for, you know, a tournament on television or whatever but to me it it, it 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 doesn't have the same spark unless it's on pay-per-view so we're going all the way back to 1999 we didn't get to touch on this one last year um this was probably one of the weaker king of the ring tournaments in terms of the wrestling it was very successful though we're in the heart of the attitude era they did about 20,108 at the greensboro north carolina uh coliseum so this is flair country and yeah it seemed to me like Austin was a little bit more over in the Carolinas than he, he normally would be in other cities. Uh, the pay-per-view buy rate did 440,000 buys. So, yeah, make no mistake about it. You know, King of the Ring 99 was definitely successful. Not quite as successful as King of the Ring 2000. I think that's the crowning uh, King of the Ring in terms of buy rate. They did about 475,000 buys. Um, so... Depends on how you want to look at it. I think they raised the prices by 2001, but, you know, the king of pay-per-view buy race for King of the Ring will be 2000. You want to give the credit to Kurt Angle or The Rock for winning the title back, you know, you could decide yourself. But, yeah, we're going to go right to King of the Ring 99. Yeah, this is 1999. You know, 99 wasn't my favorite year, and it's because of this. I mean, just, you know, the, the, the wrestling quality in the tournament, uh, it, the booking definitely got in the way of it. You know, it's not a, it's not a sexy talent lineup in terms of the guys that advanced to the pay per view. But I still thought the pay per view had potential, though. When you look at the guys that advanced to the tournament. Um, all right, so the first match you got X Pac taking on Hardcore Holly. Hardcore Holly hits X Pac with an unprotected chair shot. S X Pac is selling a neck injury throughout the whole tournament. Uh, yeah, I thought these two guys could have had a much better match and uh without a doubt th these were probably two of the bright spots with the tournament but you know hardcore holly cut a really bad promo on big show uh after the match was over and uh yeah just um a little bit underwhelming way to start off the tournament next up you got kane taking on big show a uh, very attractive match as as we saw back last 2006 we got a younger version of both guys uh, both guys looked a little bit more athletic, but it didn't really equate for a better wrestling match. You still, still saw a lot of botches here. Um, ultimately, Kane hits Big Show with an unprotected chair shot behind the referee's back, and Kane advances uh, to the next round of the tournament. Next up, you got Billy Gunn taking on Ken Shamrock. All right, so Shamrock actually got into a fight with Shane McMahon. Both guys ended up getting injured, but Shamrock, uh, you know, t because of retaliation for hurting Shane, he actually... Uh, was bleeding from the mouth so he had like all this I don't know what it was it looked like dark blood coming out of his mouth had a had a tough time breathing uh, so the referee actually stopped the match so Billy Gunn goes over Ken Shamrock to advance next up you got Road Dog taking on China China's out there with Triple H as the manager so Triple H had the night off so you kind of have to put uh, the pieces of the, of the puzzle together here you know this ended up being really good they got about 13 minutes out there it almost felt like because Triple H had, you know, didn't have a match. He had enough time to help China out with the match and help it with the structure and the booking. And they actually got 13 minutes out there, and it's actually really good. You know, I'm not a huge Road Dog fan. I find it very difficult to talk about a lot of his TNA work. But, you know, make no mistake about it, man. I mean, Road Dog was uh, really entertaining. I mean, how many people at school used to impersonate Road Dog with the mannerisms and the, the theatrics? and uh, the punches and all that stuff. And I got to give it up to China. I thought China looked good here. You know, I, I think China's a horrible wrestler, but, you know, she definitely had her moments uh, in this match here. And, uh, yeah, I, I just thought it was a lot of fun. Definitely the best match. Maybe the best match from the whole King of the Ring tournament on the pay-per-view. It's quite possible. And then next up, you got the Hardy Boys with... Um, Michael Freebird Hayes out there. Yeah, he, he really got involved in this thing. Yeah, so so Michael Michael Hayes was always a huge uh, supporter of Edge and the Hardy Boys, uh, especially like when you look back at, uh, you know, when he was in charge of SmackDown. So you got the Hardy Boys taking on The Brood, who was actually Edge and Christian coming out there with Gangrel. Um, so this is a tag team match to determine the number one contenders for the tag team titles. 
Yeah, this this was good stuff, man. I mean, the, both the Hardys and Edge and Christian look hungry. They had different attire back then. Uh, it was just different. It was it was really different. Fast paced. I mean, they they really there was really no babyface heel dynamic here. You definitely have Michael Hayes and Gangrel uh, interfering here. I think Gangrel actually cost Edge and Christian the match. But I'll tell you, even back then, they did the Edge and Jeff Hardy uh, spot. You know, Jeff Jeff usually goes for that. I want to say it's whisper in the wind, but you know when he when Jeff runs into the turnbuckle and he kind of gives it like a like a side like a side drop kick. Edge actually jumps off the second turnbuckle and spears Jeff in midair before he even does it. Uh, so yeah, even back then you saw Edge and Jeff do counters to that uh, you know do that spear counter. And obviously, when you look at WrestleMania 17, that's when they mastered it and pulled off one of the one of the most famous spots in wrestling history. So yeah, a little short and sweet teaser of uh, you know what the Hardys and Edge and Christian would eventually do. You know later on in No Mercy that year they had the classic uh, ladder match. All right, next up you had Billy Gunn uh, defeat Kane. Uh, the match lasted about five minutes. This 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 was tough to make work, but ultimately Big Show comes out while the referee's down, distracts Kane, and Billy Gunn hits the Famouser uh, to defeat Kane uh, to move on to the finals. Next up, you got X Pac uh, defeating Road Dog. So uh, yeah, this this gets very little time. I thought this really had potential. You got two friends here, two friends from Degeneration X. Uh, X-Pac actually hits the X-Factor after fighting off uh, the neck pain and uh, defeats Road Dog. Road Dog uh, gives him a handshake, though. They have the code of honor here. They even Road Dog even lifts the ropes for X-Pac to leave, and uh, you get two friend, you know, two friends in the same stable. And Jerry Lawler was saying on commentary that it made him sick that they were so friendly to each other, but that's how it was. So the finals here is Billy Gunn taking on X-Pac. But before we get to the finals, we got... The Undertaker defending the championship. He's got Paul Bear out there. This is during the whole Ministry of Darkness storyline. So it made sense for Paul Bear to reunite with The Undertaker. And uh, they're taking on The Rock. Really not a lot of storyline here. The Rock actually defeated Triple H in a number one contenders match. They actually um, blamed China for The Rock getting the victory here. Really not a lot of storyline. Rock cut a funny promo kind of mocking The Undertaker for talking in tongue. And, uh, yeah, Rock was great there. But I'll tell you what, you know, the, the Rock at that time, you know, he still had a ways to go. I got to credit Foley, man. I mean, I, I, I sometimes I feel like the Rock takes Foley for granted. But, you know, Rock teaming up with Foley with the whole this is your life and the Rock and Sock connection, I really think that took the Rock to the next level. Because look at it here. He's going for the championship, and it's not even in the main event. It's not even the second match in the main event because you got King of the Ring. So just wanted to make that point. But, yeah, kind of another underwhelming match between Taker and The Rock. Uh, you know, you could argue that it was better than the No Way Out match, but not that much better. Um, you know, I mean, just another guy that Taker had lousy chemistry with. So Undertaker has lousy chemistry with Austin, which everyone says every time I rate an Austin-Undertaker match. And, you know, most would agree he had lousy chemistry with The Rock. And did he have lousy chemistry with Triple H? I don't know. That's just Undertaker right there. He didn't really click with everybody. But I think over the years, I just think Taker got a lot better, like, after a lot of the Attitude Era gimmick stuff kind of uh, was put to rest. That's kind of my take on it. And, you know, Taker and The Rock, someone actually asked, and I talked about this at No Way Out 2002, you know, someone asked The Rock, you know, how do you feel about facing The Undertaker, you know, with the with the streak on the line? And, and Rock was kind of nonchalant. He was just like, yeah, I already faced The Undertaker before. I just think The Rock didn't want to do the job to Taker at, at that particular time because at the time, like, everyone knew The Undertaker was going to go over. Plus, Rock had already, he already lost, he lost Undertaker on the show with the Tombstone. So I don't think he was really ever motivated to face Taker uh, at WrestleMania when you consider how many times they worked together. Plus, the streak really didn't become a big thing until The Rock was like fully invested full time in Hollywood. So that might be a reason why. But but yeah, you know, Rock does the job here. The, the match is a lot of fun. I mean, the beginning of the match, there was a ref bump and Rock hit the rock bottom. Taker hit the two, uh, choke slam. So they started doing finishers right away and the fans actually bought into some of the near falls uh believe it or not but then they did some brawling around the arena then kind of slow methodical undertaker stuff the highlight of the match was paul bear put ether in a in a cloth so 
anytime you hear the word ether, you think of Nas. Nas's diss song that Jay Z was actually called Ether, and he says, Ether, the stuff that makes your soul burn slow. Uh, so yeah, ether is the type of thing that can kill you. It, I mean, it, it makes you burn. So it, I don't know if it was really ether, but they, uh, rock actually spit water, but undertaker, you know, brought out the ether. So that definitely stands out for me, but I mean, they did some good stuff. You know, taker did a beautiful, uh, counter into a DDT after countering a backdrop. I mean, that was cool. There was a, there was a pretty entertaining counter to the people's elbow, people's elbow into a choke slam. That was cool. But you know, um, you know, they, they were rock and triple h refuting this whole summer as well i mean right it seemed like rock and triple h refuting the whole time during the attitude era so you know triple h didn't have anything to do so he pedigrees rock rock kicks out of the pedigree but ultimately taker pins rock from a uh, a tombstone and sadly uh undertaker retains the title this is the only time the taker had that big winged eagle title and it only lasted a whole month and taker actually lost the belt the very next night on raw uh, to Austin, but uh, you know, that's pretty well documented. But and and that that would start the whole end of an era, first blood storyline, and then the finals of the King of the Ring. We got Billy Gunn taking on X Pac. I promise I won't Billy Gunn this King of the Ring. Um, okay, so I, I I really thought this had potential. I I really wanted to like this match. Um, and, you know, they they tried to make X Pac the sympathetic babyface that was you know kicking out of everything, but. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough to follow a title match like that. This is a long show. This is the 14th match of the night when you factor in the Sunday Night Heat stuff. Uh, but ultimately, uh, X-Pac is selling the neck injury. Billy Gunn does the Famouser off the top rope and puts him away. But, you know, the, the Famouser is is a leg. It's almost like a leg scissors on the neck. So I, I thought that was a good finish. Good finish, but, you know, Billy Gunn wasn't really able to capitalize on this King of the Ring victory. Uh, you know, th what this led to Billy Gunn facing The Rock at SummerSlam. I remember The Rock, you know, buried Billy Gunn with the I'm an asshole because Billy Gunn comes out. It's like, I'm an ass, man. And uh, you do remember The Rock kind of shitting all over Billy Gunn and, and uh, you know, uh, the night after SummerSlam uh, when he was on commentary that night. But, you know, uh, but yeah, what, what really resonates about this Billy Gunn victory, it's, it's kind of, um, Jim Ross used the analogy that it was kind of, you know, winning King of the Ring at times. It's like the Sports Illustrated curse. It's like you think guys are going to get to the main event level, and it's, it ended up being more of a curse for Billy Gunn. And, um, you know, it was icing on the cake. After Edge won King of the Ring, Billy Gunn interrupted him and said, you never beat me, and I wasn't even in the damn tournament. And uh, Edge, Edge told William Regal, I promise I won't Billy Gunn this King of the Ring tournament, because if my assignment in two years is to go to WWF New York and eat a meatball sandwich, then shoot me in the friggin' head. So yeah, Edge really buried Billy Gunn that night, uh, and uh, I, I think Billy Gunn didn't really last that much longer with the company uh, uh, after that, but that was in 2001. Uh, but I always thought it was funny how, how Edge said, I won't Billy Gunn this King of the Ring. It was, it was one of the best promos Edge ever had, so if you want to see a great Edge promo, uh, check out the King of the Ring coronation uh, the, the night after King of the Ring 2001 on Raw. Uh, and then the main event, we got Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon taking on Stone Cold Steve Austin. Uh, so like I was saying, guys, Shawn Michaels was the uh, commissioner. He actually called himself the sheriff at the time. He actually promoted his uh, wrestling school. He had the Shawn Michaels Academy wrestling school t-shirt on. He had the number on the back. And it's funny because two days earlier, the Spurs won the championship in San Antonio, and Brian Danielson uh, talked about it in his book how, you know, when he got to San Antonio, there's all this celebrating because the Spurs had just won the title on Friday night, June 25th. And, uh, yeah, so uh, so Sean made sure that Shane would wrestle in the match, even though Shane ended up getting hurt. It, originally, Steve, you know, Steve Blackman actually came out, and Vince is actually trying to explain him the rules, but... Sean decided that Shane was healthy enough to compete, so he brought Shane out. So you got Vince and Shane taking on Stone Cold Steve Austin. This is a very uh, layered storyline right here. This is the higher power storyline as well. So, I, I mean, the storyline is a little bit complicated to explain, but the bottom line was, you know, Vince actually used Stephanie McMahon as a way to screw Austin out of the title. He, you know, he was the higher power, you know, they were sacrificing Stephanie uh, to the undertaker and, and Vince actually was able to get Austin to help uh, save Stephanie. But the, the whole time they were, they had this higher power storyline going on. So yeah, you really got to watch the television show to get into it. I'll give Russo credit. It was a very well layered storyline. And, and because, um, 
you know, Vince was the higher power. Stephanie felt betrayed. And, and then Linda actually stepped down and gave the CEO, the chief executive officer role to Stone Cold Steve Austin. So, and, and that was pretty cool. You know, you, you saw a collage here of uh, Austin at the uh, headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut. The highlight of it was he actually fired this guy. He's like, you're fired for looking stupid. Um, so you have that. And, and Vince was great here. I got to give Vince McMahon credit. He said, the only thing worse than having Austin as champion is having him being the, the the CEO of the World Wrestling Federation and and you know Vince actually had a really good line here too he said he, when when he came out as the higher power he said there's nothing you know there's there's nothing he wouldn't do to make sure that Austin uh, you know was not the champion um, there's no level he wouldn't go down to so. But uh, yeah, I don't think I really did it justice. But I got to say, uh, this is the heart, or this is the blow-off of the whole Vince McMahon-Austin uh, storyline. It, it really is. Um, so so this is a ladder match. And, uh, you know, the winner, if, if, you, if you grab the briefcase, you get full control of the company. Um, it was entertaining. I, I wouldn't say it was a great match. Um, you know, by the, by the Titan Tron area, by the ramp, there, there's all these ladders set up it's like a castle of ladders ladders set up horizontally vertically if you pull this chain you could collapse the ladders it, you know austin walking on the ladders it, like i was a little bit worried i was like man you don't want austin to fall here i mean we're only one month removed from over the edge so that was kind of going through my mind austin actually takes this chain and if you pull the chain it collapses the ladder so he collapsed the ladders on shane that was really cool uh, but, you know, the, the, some of the bumps here, Austin looked like he had a tough time. He had a tough time with the elbow drop through the table. Uh, Vince actually knocked him off the ladder through a table. You know, very shallow bumps, but because of Austin's situation, he just looked like he was in a lot of pain. Um, but, yeah, you know, pr pretty fun stuff. You know, Austin gave Vince and Shane the stunners. Looked like he was going to generically win the match. But as he's going for the briefcase, they actually, someone is actually you know, raising the briefcase so Austin doesn't get it. Then Austin gets all pissed off. He's like, what the hell's going on? He starts yelling at Jim Ross, starts yelling at the timekeeper. And then ultimately, um, you know, Vince actually shoves Austin off the ladder and then Shane goes and grabs it as they actually lower it for Shane. So Vince and Shane actually win, uh, win back control of the company. It was funny because Jim Ross was like, they got to get their resumes ready. They're going to be unemployed after this match is over. But, um, but yeah, the next night on Raw, Austin gets the last laugh and wins the championship back, even though he doesn't have uh, full ownership of the company. But hey, you know, it kind of got me thinking, you know, the, the closest wrestler, I guess, to owning the company would would probably be Triple H as he married into the family. But uh, yeah, this is kind of uh, kind of got, I'm reading a book about the Knicks and Pat Riley right now. Hopefully I have a review of it up uh, up soon. But it just kind of got me thinking like, um, you know, maybe Cena or, or, or maybe The Rock. You know, you kind of wonder how come they didn't really want to stake in ownership of the company. Maybe that's something that someone can play with uh, down the road. Um, because, you know, the, the, the one time it paid off in the NBA is when Riley asked the Knicks for ownership because it was a dual ownership. It didn't really work out. And I'll talk more about it later. But ultimately, Riley ended up getting a piece of the heat. And let's make no mistake about it. I mean, look how much that paid off for the Miami Heat to give, you know, giving Riley that stake in ownership. So, uh, yeah, just something to think about. Ownership within the WWE. But, uh, but yeah. That's pretty much how it ends. I mean, the, this wasn't the this is the last time Vince and Austin, I think, got into the ring for this particular, you know, this version of the Vince and Austin storyline. Uh, but, you know, it would kind of it would kind of end up being more of an Austin versus Undertaker situation as you get into the heart of the summertime as, you know, Austin actually beat Taker the next night on Raw. But that's pretty much it. That's King of the Ring 1999. Uh, pretty entertaining stuff. The non King of the Ring stuff was entertaining. But from a wrestling standpoint, I would definitely say the King of the Rings tournament was a little bit horrific. And uh, I, I would definitely say Billy Gunn is probably the poster boy for, along with Mabel, as one of the weaker uh, King of the Ring tournament winners. Uh, Ed said it best. I want Billy Gunn this King of the Ring. I think that sums it up perfectly. So that's King of the Ring 1999. Financially successful, critically a little bit sloppy. And I'm out.